First of all, good afternoon, everyone. My name's um, Tim O'Brien. I'm a science manager at the Arthur Ryler Institute, and um, I'd like you to, to welcome you to this seminar on the benefits of revegetation for biodiversity. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also to any traditional owners joining us today. I'm meeting with you today from Wurundjeri country. Um, look, revegetation programs offer us a unique opportunity to, to incorporate two ways of knowing, and I know a number of us are really looking forward to some project, new opportunities to work with traditional owners and share the, this knowledge. So, um, so it's a really good timing for this particular project. With today's presentation split into two components that have been completed over the past two years. It's been a partnership project between La Trobe University and ARI, with funding support from DELP's Biodiversity on Ground Actions Program. First, we'll hear from Dr. Sasha Yelenek, who will present on the research to develop and trial a rapid method for assessing the survival and growth of revegetation plantings. And Sasha is now continuing revegetation research with at the Waterways Ecosystem Research Group with Melbourne Uni and Melbourne Water. Then we'll, this will be followed by Dr. Angie, Angie Haslam from La Trobe University, who's led this research to identify the features of reveg that most increase their value for animals and to identify which species benefit most from revegetation. We'll finish off with some time for questions, so please hold these to the end of the presentations, or you can post questions in the chat room. Could I ask that everyone check that their microphones are muted and their cameras are turned off during the presentations? And just to let everyone know that we are recording this session for people who can't make it along. So Sasha, if you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Good afternoon all. Thank you very much for coming along. My name is Sasha Yelnek and I was working on this project with the Arthur Isler Institute and La Trobe University. And we were looking at evaluating revegetation monitoring outcomes from a community-based monitoring program. And revegetation is part of the restoration continuum. So we're looking to remediate and rehabilitate land in the first instance, so improving and repairing ecosystem function ideally. And then through this process of revegetation, we want to initiate native recovery and hopefully that'll lead to partial or full recovery of the native ecosystem. And this is what we call ecological restoration. So the goals of this are to improve environmental conditions and to reverse degradation and ultimately to increase ecosystem health, the biodiversity of the region and also the ecosystem services that are occurring. Monitoring is really vital for us to learn about the effectiveness of our revegetation and what those revegetation outcomes might be. So we want to get a better understanding of how different species, for example, survive and grow over time, and also different provenances. If you're planting seed from hotter and drier climates, for example, to see how that survives in your local area. We're also interested in knowing by monitoring to see if animals start to use these areas, if they become functional ecosystems. And we know there's multiple factors that influence revegetation. And this can be changes over seasons and years and also geographical changes. And we also know that environmental variables such as climate change, so extreme weather events, um, extreme temperatures over the hottest months or lack of rainfall can really influence the effectiveness of revegetation, as can how the site's been prepared, what pest animals and plants are present, and also what the land use history has been. So if it's been used for agricultural land for a long time in comparison to say an area which has more recently been cleared. And ultimately this enables us to report on our out outcomes more effectively. And hopefully we can do restoration in a more cost-effective manner by adaptively, manage these adaptively managing these landscapes over time. So land managers and community groups are really vital in this role of monitoring revegetation. 
because they've got a really good understanding of the landscape, they're local to the area and have usually undertaken a lot of the revegetation. So La Trobe University and the Arthur Elder Institute worked with land care groups, catchment management authorities, non-government organisations such as Bush Heritage and Greening Australia, water authorities such as Gippsland Water and private landowners all across Victoria to see how effective revegetation actions were in these areas. So we came up with a quick, quick and robust monitoring technique that community groups could use to assess their revegetation outcomes. So essentially, we were mostly looking at the survival and growth of revegetated areas. And we also want to identify what factors were influencing the survival of these revegetated areas. And you can see from this map that a lot of the monitoring was taken on multiple catchment management authorities all across Victoria. And this study was all about trialling this monitoring method that we developed and also assessing plant survival after the first summer. So the study took place in 2019 to 2020. So it ended around um, March, April this year. And this is what the monitoring pr protocol looked like. So it was broken down into different sheets that people could fill out. So um, project and site information, what the in initial monitoring was and how many plants they recorded, and then follow up monitoring after the first summer to see the survival of these plants. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail in the next slides. So June to September, we asked community groups if they could go out and monitor their revegetated areas. And they usually set up two to three plots within a one hectare area. And the plots were usually 50 metres by four metres in size. And these were had star pickets put in, in all of their corners and were also GPS. So they were a more permanent plot that people could go back to over time. We asked people to go and record all the plant species to species level within the plot and also do counts of those species. And over the site level um, details, we asked people to record what the land use history of the site was, for example, what the site's preparation was, if the plants were guarded and with what. So there was also a lot of detail um, measured in these site level details. And then we asked people to go back after the first summer, so March to April, to revisit these plots and record all the plants that were alive and the height of the first plant, the height of the first five plants for each species within a plot area. So the monitoring was all about going and recording the plants that were first planted and then going back up for summer to record what survived. Now, the community groups monitored 137 plots at 65 sites across eight CMA regions. And we found that overall we had 57% survival of individual plants, so that's all species combined in each plot, or 76% survival as far as the species richness in each plot goes. So we had a drop in abundance, but species richness remained um, fairly high. And this is a plot for the catchment management authorities. And you can see that East Gippsland and Port Phillip and Western Port generally had high, quite high planting abundances and East Gippsland especially and also West Gippsland had generally higher survival across these planting areas. So this is, sorry, the bars represent, the orange bars represent spring, so directly after planting and the blue bars represent survival after the first summer. And if we look at the bioregion um, comparisons, we see that the Southeast Highlands, again, had the highest um, abundance and relatively high survival compared to other sites. 
species richness again was really high in the southeast highlands and we saw a bit of a decline in species richness in this area and the lower species richness we found was usually in the um, Victorian Midlands. And this is a plot showing all of the different species of the 16 most commonly planted species within the study area. So this is across the whole of Victoria. And we generally saw that um, goodenia, um, swamp paperbark, and two acacia species, as well as swamp gum, generally had quite high survival. And things like um, Bessaria, sweet Bessaria, she oak, and also tea tree had lower survival overall. And we found that both rainfall and if the plants were guarded had a significant effect on if the plants survived over time. So generally we had higher survival if the rainfall was high and higher survival if the plants were guarded. We also wanted to know how good our monitoring technique was, how people found it, and also what factors would increase the monitoring uptake and how we could make the monitoring methods better. So we sent out 43 questionnaires in April and we received about half of these back. So around 22 surveys re were returned and these were largely returned by land care groups and catchment and management authority staff. And we found that most people found the ethic the methods are very easy to understand and generally quite easy to undertake. So you'll see on the orange bar is showing the ease of method to understand and the blue bar is the ease of method to undertake and the percentage of um, respondents across the side. And we also wanted to know what would allow people to undertake these monitoring methods in the future. And we found that overall more funding was needed for monitoring activities by community groups and also an online database where people could enter their data into via an app and also see how their sites were changing over time. We also found that more staff time was needed and more training in the monitoring methods, ideally. And if people could get feedback on their monitoring results could, so they could adaptively manage their plantings over time. So we found that management actions were really important to Walter if we wanted to get good revegetation results. So if we looked at the effect of climate, such as lower rainfall or possibly extreme tem temperatures, which is what some of the literature suggests, we may need to alter our planting times so we get the good rainfall that these plants need. And as the seasons are likely to become hotter and drier, and drier especially over the winter months, we may need to move our planting times forward in order to get better survival over time. And we also may need to look at using climate adapted seed or different provenance seed to get good revegetation results. We also should look at guarding our plants wherever we can and also trial the different guard types to see which ones do best over time. And we also need to take into account what soil type there is, where we're planting, and also the planting regions. So we want to basically adapt our planting to the environmental conditions. And if those environmental conditions are hot and dry, we may look, need to look at species which are more adapted to those conditions. But we need to note that multiple factors influence plant survival. It's not just one of these factors. So this is why monitoring is so vital to undertake so you can get a much better understanding of how our revegetation is changing over time. So in summary, mon 
monitoring, monitoring can be really effectively done by practitioners and community groups. And we found that rainfall and protection by guards can increase the survival of plants across Victoria. But we need to get this data, we need more funding to allow community groups to undertake monitoring. And we need to, a database to be set up and an app so people can more effectively enter data while they're in the field. And there's a number of knowledge gaps that we need to look into. So what are the influence of climate change on revegetated as well as remnant habitats? How does structure and function of these revegetated areas change over time? And how are animals using these areas compared to natural areas? And what are the social values or benefits of restoration? And how can we get community groups more involved in not only planting these areas, but also monitoring restored areas? And there's been a number of resources which have been published from this study. And this is available on the ARI website um, in the middle. So there's a number of pack sheets which have been produced, but we're also hoping to publish a paper on this soon. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the community groups who undertook this monitoring and they showed great commitment. It was really great to be involved in such a community-based project. So I'd really like to thank everyone who took part in this study. And if you want to take revegetation monitoring in the future, please contact me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Sasha. It's terrific. It's a really nice collaborative project and uh, we're certainly keen to continue this post-COVID. I'll hand straight over to Angie Haslam now, um, so she can just take over the presentation and, and uh, then we'll hold off questions till after Angie's presentation. So thanks, Angie. Thanks, Tim. Can you just confirm you can see it okay? Yes, all good, thanks. Great. Okay, so as Tim said, my name's Angie Haslam, and today I'm going to be presenting some work from a research project that we've recently completed, which has looked at the value of revegetation for birds in farm environments. And a particular focus of this project has been on understanding how this value changes over time. Now, you can see that this work's been undertaken by quite a large group of us, so while I'm presenting today, presenting is the efforts of lots of different people. So revegetation in farm landscapes is undertaken for a range of objectives. It can provide production benefits. Here think of shelter belts or farm woodlots. It can reverse environmental degradation and good examples here are plantings along eroded streamlines and it also has aesthetic value. All plantings, whatever their objective that they've been undertaken for, can also provide um, value for conservation because they can provide habitat for animals in these otherwise cleared environments. And it can do this at a range of different spatial scales. So at the level of uh, the local level or at the level of individual plantings, revegetation provides a range of habitat resources that animals can use um, for their foraging or shelter requirements. At the landscape level, we don't know quite as much about the value of revegetation for fauna, but we do know that at this landscape level, animals can respond strongly to the amount of vegetation or habitat within the landscape. And conservation planning often also takes a broader scale perspective. So this represents a gap in our understanding about the value of revegetation for fauna, how it's operating at this broader scale. Whatever scale we're talking about though, whether it's the local or the landscape level, a key feature of revegetation is that it changes over time. So vegetation matures from tube stocks, which are planted through to well-established vegetation. And as this process happens, the habitat provided by fauna changes quite dramatically. And with these changes come changes in the value for animals of the habitat provided by reveg. So in this study, we've looked at a couple of questions around these broad themes that I've just introduced. At the landscape scale, we were interested in testing whether revegetation plantings can serve to reverse the loss of native species from agricultural environments that we know goes along with the process of vegetation loss. So does revegetation return bird species to farm landscapes 
or is it simply just um, providing more resources for the fewer species that have managed to persist over time? And at the local level, we were interested in looking at which attributes of plantings improve their value for native species. Both of these levels, we've also looked at how this value of revegetation changes over time. So to answer these questions, we've built on a large study that was undertaken within the Glenelg Hopkins CMA in 2006-2007. The original study took a landscape scale approach to understanding the value of revegetation for biodiversity. And so on this map, you can see that a number of blue circles, each of which represented a different study landscape of 800 hectares in size. So this is a circular area of just over three kilometres in diameter. And there were 30, 43 sorry, of these landscapes distributed around the Hamilton region. Now, because in this study we were interested in testing whether revegetation can return species um, to cleared landscapes that have been lost as vegetation is cleared, these 43 landscapes were carefully selected to represent different gradients or gradients in um, the cover of different vegetation types. So 11 landscapes were selected to native vegetation and they across these 11 landscapes contained decreasing cover of this native vegetation. So you can see at the high end of my little diagrams here, uh, landscapes contained 18% cover, decreasing down to a cover of about 1%. Collectively, these landscapes represented a gradient in vegetation loss. There were 21 different landscapes that contained predominantly revegetation and increasing amounts of revegetation plantings across the 21 landscapes. And collectively, these landscapes are representing a gradient of vegetation restoration. So two broadly different types of landscapes that I'm going to talk about today, remnant landscapes and revegetation landscapes. Now, the original study did also include an additional 11 landscapes which contained both of these types of vegetation, so both native vegetation and restoration, but I'm not going to talk so much about them today. Okay, so within each of these 800 hectare landscape areas, there were 12 study sites established. Each of them was one hectare in size, and they were distributed amongst uh, a range of key habitat types that are common across the region. So we sampled in native vegetation, revegetation, scattered paddock trees amongst pasture, areas of open pasture and crop, and also wetlands and farm dams if they occurred in landscapes. At each site, there were four bird surveys undertaken across a one year period and one habitat or vegetation assessment. So what I've just described is a quick um, summary of the design and field methods for the study in 2007. Now in 2019, we've gone back and resampled 23 of the original 43 landscapes. We have focused on the remnant and revegetation landscapes only, but we've gone back to exactly the same sites and undertaken exactly the same field protocols when it comes to collecting data on birds in landscapes and also habitat, um, habitat assessments too. So this has given us two data sets with which to track change in the value of revegetation over time for birds at both of these spatial scales that I've talked about. At the landscape level, we've got our 800 hectare study landscapes, which are represented by these circles on the map. And we've also can look at the local, the value of plantings at the local level with our one hectare site data as well. And I'd just like to quickly draw your attention to the fact that Within each of our two time periods separately, we've sampled revegetation plantings across a range of ages. So in 2007, the plantings that we sampled ranged in age from 2 to 40 years, and then 12 years later in 2019, 14 to 52 years of age. So a range of ages in both time periods. So just to start a quick summary of the bird species that we've recorded across landscapes and time periods. In total, there are 164 native species recorded, and 60 of these species were those which we referred to as woodland dependent species. So these are species that are entirely dependent on native vegetation for all their habitat and breeding requirements. And they're the species that we're most interested that revegetation will return to the landscape. So I'm going to focus on woodland species in this talk today. 
90% of these woodland species were recorded at one point in time in revegetation. And broadly speaking, you can see down here in this Venn diagram that revegetation increased the number of woodland species by over 400% when compared to areas of open paddock or pasture. Now within revegetation, we found a, um, some species that were particularly common. So recorded at over 70% of sites in both time periods. And they included species like the brown thornbill and the red wattle bird. On the other hand, there were a handful of species that we never recorded in revegetation in any landscape or survey. However, these species were either fairly uncommon in the study region overall and also rare within native vegetation. And at this point, it's also worth mentioning that we didn't record noisy miners um, at all commonly. I think there was one record in the second survey period. So while noisy miners might be considered a strong influence on the value of revegetation plantings for birds in other regions, they're not likely to be influencing results in this region. So first of all, I'm going to present some results of our landscape level analyses. So here I'm talking about our 800 landscapes. And remember, we had two different sorts, remnant landscapes and revegetation landscapes. What you're looking at here is the number of woodland bird species that were recorded on average in these two landscape types in 2007. And you can see that there were significantly more woodland bird species in remnant landscapes than revegetation landscapes. In fact, reveg landscapes had 25% fewer species than remnant landscapes in 2007. I've now added data from 2019 to the same plot and you can see that by 12 years later there's no difference in the number of woodland bird species that these two different landscapes are supporting. So while we saw an increase by 30% in the number of woodland bird species in our reveg landscapes shown here in light green, the number of species in remnant landscapes hadn't changed over time. Now this does match what we were predicting to see because we had expected greater change in our reveg landscapes just due to the fact that the habitats that they comprise themselves are changing over time as plantings mature and develop. Whereas the native vegetation in our remnant landscapes is not undergoing nearly as much change because it's already mature. So good news, but doesn't quite answer one of our main questions, which was whether increasing amounts of revegetation, so does returning vegetation to the landscape serve to return species that are lost as vegetation has been cleared? So on this graph here, what we're looking at is the cover of wooded vegetation in the landscape expressed as a proportion of the landscape, and on the y-axis again, the species richness of woodland birds. First of all, this is the results from 2007. And first of all, if we have a look at the brown line at the top of the graph, this relates to our remnant landscapes. Remember, these collectively represented our gradient in vegetation loss. So you can see as vegetation um, is decreasing in the landscape, or as landscapes have less vegetation, they support fewer woodland bird species. This is a relationship that has been found before. And in this study, what we were more interested in is what, what's going on in our reveg landscapes. So if you have a look at the green line, here you can see that as vegetation is added back to the landscape, we are seeing more woodland bird species returned, which is a really exciting result. But in 2007, the gap between the two lines here shows us that the number of species returned to the landscape doesn't match the number that were lost as vegetation was cleared. So now I've fast forwarded 12 years and shown um, data from 2019, and you can see that the two lines match. So there's, while there was no change in this relationship for our remnant landscapes, our revegetation landscapes are now returning the same number of species for a given cover of vegetation that are found in a remnant landscapes. So this result shows that revegetation can reverse the loss of species from these farm landscapes that is associated with vegetation clearing, because the number of species returned to our reveg landscapes is the same as those in remnant landscapes for a given cover of vegetation. However, while that's a really positive and really exciting result, it doesn't quite tell the full story. Because while we saw the same number of woodland bird species in our two different landscape types, the composition or the types of species in the bird communities in our broadly different types of landscapes did differ. And that's what this plot shows. 
So each of the dots on this plot here represent a different study landscape, and I've shown each study landscape in both time periods. The closer together the, the dots are on this um, the plot space shows landscapes that have more similar bird assemblages, whether the, whereas those that are further apart had assemblages that differed quite strongly from each other. And I've coloured dots based on the landscape type. So you can see in light green, we've got our revegetation landscapes and dark green are our remnant. So just the fact that our revegetation are clustering closer together and separately from our remnant landscapes is really showing that the sorts of species that they're containing are broadly different. And you can see that's the case in both survey periods. Now we did find some evidence to suggest that the assemblages in revegetation landscapes are becoming more similar to those in remnant landscapes over the 12 years between surveys. So here what we're looking at on the y-axis of this graph is just simply a measure of the difference in bird communities between our reveg and our remnant landscapes. And you can see that there's greater difference between communities in these two landscapes in the first survey period in light blue, less difference in 2019 in dark blue. So some sign that there's convergence in community composition over time. But remembering the previous slide, really we're still seeing different assemblages, even in the second survey period, between our remnant and our reveg landscapes. So what this means is that there's broadly different kinds of birds that are associated with these different landscape types. There's some overlap, but some differences too. And in terms of the species that were particularly associated with our revegetation landscapes, they were those species that are commonly associated with dense shrubby understory layers. So species like the red browed finch, the white browed scrub wren, or the superb fairy wren. In contrast, species that were more strongly associated or recorded more commonly in our remnant landscapes were those associated with mature or older vegetation. So species requiring of canopy or bark layers for foraging based in tree hollows. And I've got some examples here. And what these results are showing is that revegetation provides different or complementary habitat to native vegetation. It's, these results are suggesting that revegetation is not entirely replicating the resources that native vegetation is providing at this point in time because of these different assemblages of species in our two landscape types. So that's all the results I'm going to present today relating to our landscape level sort of focus. So just some quick summary of our key findings when it comes to management and planning before I move on to looking at the value of revegetation at the local scale. So firstly, our results show that revegetation can reverse species loss associated with vegetation clearing in farm landscapes. But this process takes time. It's not immediate which means that some level of forward planning is going to be required when it comes to thinking about restoring habitats to landscapes at these broader scales. And planning at this larger scale also provides opportunities for thinking about placing plantings in a way that enhances their connectivity across the landscape, which we know is really important for a range of species. And here a way to do this would be to revegetate along creek lines, for example. Secondly, we found that all plantings contribute to overall vegetation cover. Now, this might seem like a fairly obvious conclusion, but in this study, some, uh, most of the plantings that we sampled were quite small. So we're not talking about landscape scale restoration here. And they were also often undertaken for objectives other than conservation. But in combination, they're all contributing to this measure of the overall cover of vegetation in the landscape. And that measure, vegetation covering the landscape, we, we found had a positive effect on the number of woodland bird species in the landscape. So this highlights two things. Firstly, the importance of individual actions because individual plantings have benefits at broader scales, but it also highlights the capacity for coordinated efforts to really have greatest um, effect in terms of increasing this cover of vegetation at this scale. So at the higher end of cover in terms of the land, landscapes that we sampled, they had 20% cover of revegetation. And that's a feasible amount to be aiming for when you, if you're able to have collective actions from individuals, agencies, 
and various um, conservation groups working together. Thirdly, we found that reef vegetation provides habitats that differ from native vegetation in terms of the resources that they are providing for birds. This was seen in our community level analyses. And this is showing that revegetation does provide habitat of particular value for a subset of the woodland bird species in this region. So a positive finding for revegetation habitats. But the flip side of this is that it really also highlights the importance of native vegetation because revegetation plantings are not providing resources that all species are able to utilise. It's also showing that even after um, 50 years, we're the oldest of our plantings, that revegetation is not yet replicating the resources for native vegetation. So retaining and protecting native vegetation in these landscapes is going to be really important. OK, so now I'm going to focus on some of our results relating to the value of revegetation plantings at the local or planting level. Now, remember here we've also collected data from our one hectare survey plots, which is what I'm going to be using now. We've got these data from two time periods and we sampled a range of broad habitat types within landscapes and within revegetation plantings. We've also collected data from a range of different types of plantings. So we've sampled birds within shelter belts, farm woodlots, riparian plantings, and general ecological plantings amongst paddocks. First, I'm gonna start with just a quick summary of how the number of woodland bird species in these broadly different site types has changed over time. So here I've got two bars per habitat type. The first relates to the first survey period, the second, the 2019 data, and grouped by habitat type and coloured differently. So what you can see first of all is that our revegetation sites are those that have changed most in terms of the number of woodland bird species we've recorded in them over time. So they've increased by 27% in terms of woodland bird species richness. Native vegetation changed a little bit, but we didn't see any change over time in scattered trees or paddock. And obviously you can see much lower richness in these two latter habitat types, which is not surprising. It's also just worth um, touching on the point, as with the landscape level, we did see different assemblages of woodland birds at the site level, at the local level of individual plantings and individual patches of native vegetation. Again, here supporting different assemblages of woodland bird species with the same conclusions. Revegetation is particularly valuable for some species but that is not yet replicating the resources that native vegetation is providing for birds. Now, one thing we were particularly interested in looking at when it comes to the value of revegetation at the local scale was determining the relative importance of local management of revegetation plantings compared to the range of things unlikely to be influenced by management when it comes to their value, the value of plantings for birds. So there's a range of local management decisions, including things like where to plant, what to plant, why a planting is being undertaken, and even when plantings are, are put back into the landscape, that we know are going to be influencing the habitat and patch level features of plantings, which in turn will affect their value for birds. However, we also know that features of the landscape around habitat patches can influence the species that are utilising any given patch. So things like the amount of native vegetation cover or the diversity of land use types can be important. And also broader gradients in things like rainfall can also influence habitat value for animals. However, these variables are not going to be able to be influenced by local management, particularly when it comes to um, revegetation management. So in this, this sort of analysis what we've looked at is the relative importance or influence of these two broadly different types of um, attributes when it comes to the woodland birds in revegetation plantings. And what we found was that there were four decisions, four management decisions that had a particularly strong influence on the woodland birds within revegetation. Firstly, what to plant. We found that there was a greater range, sorry, greater number of woodland bird species here on the y-axis in plantings that had a greater number of tree or shrub species. So more diverse plantings supported more species. And this is simply related to the diversity of resources 
that these more diverse plantings provide for different species. Secondly, plantings with more existing vegetation in the local area, and here we're talking about vegetation in the surrounding 500 metres from the planting, had more woodland birds, as you can see here. This result is related to the fact that there's more local habitat that birds can utilise in addition to the resources provided by the revegetation planting itself when this area of local habitat is increased. So here, decisions about where to plant are important. Thirdly, decisions about planting management were found to influence woodland bird richness in plantings. So here you can see that plantings that are grazed by stock had fewer woodland bird species that those, than those that are fenced or from which um, stock is exclu excluded most of the time. And this is related to the disturbance of the ground layers by domestic stock which can influence the um, disturbance of habitat for ground foraging species in particular. And last of all, we found a positive relationship between the age of plantings and the number of bird species within them. So this shows that it's best to get plantings in the ground as soon as possible if you're considering putting in some revegetation. Now here having the two data sets, one from 2007 and one from 2019, gave us further insights into this um, improvement over time in the value of revegetation. So this graph here is um, relating to the 2007 data set. You can see plantings age, range in age from two to 40 years. By the time we um, got to 2019, with an additional 12 years of growth, we no longer saw this strong relationship of age, which suggests that in the first decade or two after planting, this rapid improvement um, is when the most rapid improvement is occurring. So the greatest sort of um, strongest increase in value and that's lost by the time we um, have older plantings. Okay, so four management decisions we found to have an important influence in particular on the conservation value of plantings. But we also did find that some attributes of the landscape around plantings also influence the number of woodland bird species within them. And here the cover of vegetation in the surrounding landscape in both the surrounding one kilometre area and five kilometres around plantings both had a positive effect on the number of species in revegetation. However, while these are strong relationships, it's really important to emphasise that they didn't override the influence of those management decisions that I've just talked about on birds in revegetation. So all of these factors are important when it comes to the value of revegetation for birds. So just to draw out what the, um, these results mean when it comes to the management and planning at the local level or the planting level for revegetation, our results showed three things. Firstly, the rapid increase in the value of plantings for boards, for birds, sorry, in the first decade or two after planting. So this confirms really that there's a relatively quick return on effort and investment when it comes to the conservation value of plantings for birds. However, it's also important to, to note that at the older stage of our plantings in 2019, they were only just over 50 years of age and they had yet to develop a number of really important habitat resources we know that species rely on. So things like tree hollows, really big branches, which in turn will fall off and provide logs on the ground for different species. What this shows is that there is expected um, increases, further increases over time in the value of these plantings. So really long term value for revegetation for fauna. This change is, is still ongoing after 50 years of age. Secondly, we've shown that local management decisions about where to plant can have measurable impacts on the conservation value of plantings for birds, which really serves to um, reinforce or confirm the really strong importance of local management when it comes to the value of revegetation for conservation. And finally, the importance of vegetation cover in the surrounding kilometres around plantings highlights that the collective actions of individuals and conservation groups are important also because it's at this level that there's greatest capacity for increasing the cover of vegetation at these broad scales. Now just for a really quick summary 
of what our results have shown for the value of revegetation for birds um, in farm landscapes. So at the local level, we found that individual plantings provide habitat resources that have value for 90% of the woodland bird species in this region. But they also contribute to the overall cover of vegetation in the landscape, so they have value in this way too. And at this level, at the level of the whole landscape, our study has shown that revegetation can reverse the loss of woodland bird species from farm landscapes that's associated with vegetation clearing. So for these reasons, revegetation is shown, has been shown in this study to be an effective conservation investment. And there's a number of reasons why it's also a feasible investment too. Plantings represent a one-off cost, but that can be added to over time to build value. Revegetation improves really rapidly, so a quick return on effort in terms of conservation value, but also has long-term value for native species in these environments. Revegetation is an action that's achievable for individuals, but through collective action, there's greater capacity to trans transform landscapes. Now, despite all of these values of revegetation, it's also really important to emphasise that these results have also highlighted the importance of native vegetation in these farm landscapes, whether it's patches of native vegetation or individual scattered trees amongst open farmland. These elements, these native remnant elements in the landscape are providing resources for species that revegetation does not yet do. OK, so just to finish off with a couple of quick points about how this works contributing to policy and management. These data sets are contributing to the strategic management prospects tool by being used to help guide the development of scenarios for expert evaluation and also by providing empirical data with which to test predictions. They've also been submitted to BirdLife Australia for use in their um, calculation of long term bird indices, which are going to be tracking bird population change over time for a report in the next State of Australia's Birds report, obviously produced by BirdLife Australia. Now, if you're interested to read any more about um, the results that I have presented today or lots of things that I haven't had time to touch on, we've produced six fact sheets which are available on the ARI publication site. Lots of people that it's important to thank for um, undertaking such a large study over, over 12 years as well. And here's some more information on where to find more information about this project and also the work Sash has presented. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ange. That was terrific. Um, really highlights the value of revegetation and also the value of setting up long term, you know, study sites. These were set up, you know, 13 years ago and the opportunity to go back and revisit them now as the revegetation age is terrific and allowed us to do this um, really comprehensive study. So well done to you and the team for coming up with the idea and then doing it so well. Um, we've got time for some questions here. Um, so, and I see there's quite a, there's a few posted in the chat, but um, and if you want to ask a question personally, there's a little hand up the top of the screen. If you want to raise your hand, I can try and call call you in to ask a question, or you can um, post it in the um, in the chat box, which is the uh, uh, also up there next to the hand as well. Hide conversation, show conversation button. So. I'll kick off. I see um, Chris Solomon's got a question here about this is for you, Sasha. Has there been any analysis of the differences in survival of different species with respect to guarding? And there's a second part. Has there been any consideration of the cost of guards for different species? Now, is guarding more effective, cost effective than simply planting more densely and anticipating loss? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. We didn't have enough data to compare different guard types between different species. Um, as I said, this is a bit more of a trial. Uh, that would be something great to do, but we basically um, need more data um, and more specific data around guard types and species within each guard type to do um, that. So shorter answer is unfortunately not, not yet anyway. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, consideration of cost effectiveness of, you know, putting guards in or just planting more densely and assuming you're going to lose some plants. To yeah, 
again, that would be a great thing to do. We didn't do it, and I suspect it would probably um, change between different CMA regions just simply because that costs more to plant in certain regions and the likelihood of survival also varies across regions. So it would almost have to be done at a um, more local level, that sort of analysis, I suspect. But yeah, again, unfortunately, we haven't done that analysis. Good. Thanks, Sasha. And there's a follow up, another question from Julie Andrew here. Is there any work being done on standardised condition monitoring of remnant native veg in Victoria? Look, I know ARI's got lots, quite a bit of monitoring and standardised methods for different areas, but in terms of implementation, maybe Ange or Sasha, you can tackle that as well. Um, I know on a national scale that um, TERN, T-E-R-N, um, which is a terrestrial ecological research network, I think. Ecosystem network, yep, um, looks at surveying remnant areas all across the country and that has a very standardised method. Um, and yeah, as Tim mentioned, there are within the site um, standardised methods. Um, yeah, Angie? No, I don't have anything further to add. Yep. yep. Um, a comment from Jonathan, just that site preparation and planted spacing has a big influence on survival as well. Yeah, absolutely. And seasonal variations are huge in this as well. So uh, and conscious that, you know, rainfall is critical and um, uh, where you plant it and luck of the draw in the year. If you plant before a 10 year drought, you're probably not going to have a lot of good fortune with revegetation. But um, so. Uh, another question from Julie here, is 20% native veg cover a realistic goal for the productive cropping landscapes and what percentage cover is too low? It's for you, Ange. Um, possibly depends on the system in terms of whether it's a realistic goal. It was certainly the maximum we could find for the, the study region that we're talking about here in the Glenelg Hopkins region. Um, I would say less than 20% is still worth aiming for. So when you say what's the minimum level, um, I, would be, I wouldn't say that there's too much that you wouldn't bother to, to worry about revegetating. So any revegetation is going to have value. And in fact, I didn't present the results today just due to time, but at this landscape level, we did find that there was greatest increases in richness that the revegetation was able to return to the landscape at the low cover level, if that makes sense. So revegetation did a disproportionately good job at returning woodland bird species to cleared landscapes that had less amount of cover. Absolutely, thanks Ange. Um, and obviously it all adds up and contributes. Um, another question from Andrea here, Was there were there studies on direct seeding too? I know we considered this, Sasha. I'm not sure whether any of your sites covered that though. We did do, oh sorry. Uh, we did do um, some monitoring of direct seeding, mostly out in the Wimmera, but we didn't include those results because it was very much in one region only. So again, it would be something um, a larger study could do, but the methods can be adapted for monitoring direct seeding for sure. Thank you. Yeah, it seemed to have, I'm not getting, uh, did, yeah, another one from Jonathan, did Angie look at the influence of noisy miners? I know you mentioned them in your talk, Angie, but I just want to. Yeah, I didn't make too much of that. Um, really good question, and that's going to be an influence that's going to be highly relevant across large parts of southeastern Australia. But for our region, there was so few that it wasn't something we could look at. So fortunate in many regards. But yeah, noisy miners is going to be something that's going to influence the value of revegetation in many other parts of the state, but not for us. Absolutely. I've got quite a few in my backyard at the moment, so you can have some from there. Um, question from Sally here. Angie, were there these sites worked on for a period of years, i.e. top up planting, maintenance, etc., or just planted out once? So, for example, in northeast Victoria, often models die out after five to ten years and don't always reproduce. So we advocate advocate top up planting. 
Yeah, another really good point, Sally, I think you said, Tim. Um, yes, no, there had been, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying very little, if any, top-up planting. We did collect data on senescence and loss of species, particularly wattles, but any sort of a loss of species that we were detecting in our vegetation assessments in 2019, but that's not, we haven't, I haven't analysed that data to check yet um, what that's showing, but I suspect that with increased time, there will be ongoing changes related to this loss of those components of the revegetation too, so that, that will be an, an ongoing effect. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Um, I think that looks like that might be it for the uh, questions from today, and the time is pretty close to done, so any last gasps for anyone? Three, two, one. Okay, well, I'll just finish off and today for some, a couple of acknowledgements for people who've helped out on the projects. So obviously the research teams involved, all the agencies and groups, traditional owners and landholders have supported this work. Much appreciated. It's been a big study over a couple of years. So well done to everyone. Thank you. The Steering Committee, committee which is Mike Clark, the Trobe, and Andrew Bennett, uh, also the Trobe, and partly ARI, and Kim Lowe, our ARI Director, and Matt White. Thank you very much for your contributions on the Steering Committee. Mark White and his team from ECP for support and project governance. And this wouldn't have happened today without Andy Gashke and Steve Werner with the backroom tech support, because it was way beyond my capabilities. And finally, thanks, of course, to all of you for attending. It's been a really good turnout and good to see the numbers come in today. I hope you can all get out for a nice walk on this beautiful day and see some nice vegetation. So thanks, everyone, for coming along. And thank you to the presenters. Um, there will be a recording of this, and I did post the link to the um, ARI site in the chat. The recording will probably come up in about a week's time, so it takes a little bit of post-processing and is away for a few days. So thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.